All right. Good morning, everyone. Today we want to cover three very important um, preliminary uh, discoveries uh, to, uh, to our quantum atom, and that's the discoveries of X-rays, the electron, and radioactivity. Um, so let's get started um, with that. It all begins with this very interesting piece of apparatus called the Crookes tube. Uh, Crookes is uh, someone who began working with this tube back in the 1870s. The tube itself, as an idea, goes back even earlier than that. Um, the idea was to use a tube like this to study uh, electricity uh, of, of gases, how electricity affected gases. Uh, very simple kind of apparatus. You just take an evacuated tube, take out as much air as you can, um, and you have two electrodes, uh, a cathode, a negative cathode, a positive anode, and to a battery. And it turns out that if you can bring the pressure down lower and lower and lower, making a better and better vacuum, at some point you get a very interesting result. You get some kind of a ray, some kind of a light ray that goes uh, well, from one side to the other. And um, this became a, a very interesting phenomenon of what was going on. But what this ray did was it closed the circuit. That is, this was like a virtual wire, even though there was nothing but a vacuum or the best vacuum that could be made at the time in that tube. But uh, if the voltage between the anode and cathode was strong enough, and you could bring the pressure down low enough, you would get a completed circuit. And um, even more interestingly, this transfer of electricity going from one side to the other actually would make the, uh, the little bit of air that was in the tube glow. Uh, and uh, it, was this, it was soon discovered that these rays, whatever they were, were going from the cathode to the anode. They were had their source on the cathode side, moving through the tube to the anode, and so they were called uh, cathode rays. And they were studied very intensely by many, many physicists throughout Europe. Um, for example, here's a, uh, a cute one where they put up a little <laughs> pinwheel, uh, uh, could turn either way, and the pinwheel would turn in the direction so that they could see that these rays, or perhaps particles, were going from the cathode to the anode because it was making the pinwheel spin um, in that direction. Uh, and of course, that was one of the great questions. Are we, are we dealing with uh, some kind of small particle or are we dealing with some kind of a wave? And, uh, and the word that, that physicists love to use when they don't know one or the other, they call it a ray. It's a ray. <laughs> it could be either one. Um, and this certainly was the time, uh, late 18th century, going up to the beginning of the uh, 20th century, sorry, late 19th century, going up to the turn of the century, that this was the era of, of rays, as we will see. Um, more interesting phenomenon about the cathode rays, they could be affected by a magnet. A magnetic field could bend these, these rays. And um, they bent in a way that showed that they were somehow or other negatively charged. Uh, this comes from the fundamental laws of uh, electromagnetism, uh, which were well known uh, uh, in the 1880s, late early 1890s. And so it could be easily determined by the bending of the rays from the magnetic field, what kind of a charge this ray had. And uh, it very much had a negative, um, negative charge to it. Obviously, if a magnetic field could bend the rays, one would say, okay, let's take a look at, at an electric field. Could an electric field um, uh, create um, the bending uh, kind of like this? You create a magnetic field rather easily with a magnet. You create an electric field right with a uh, capacitor <coughs> to uh, electrical plates. Positive and negative electrical field will be between them. That couldn't be done. Interestingly, uh, they could not, uh, when they pass this ray through the capacitor plates, they would not bend. Uh, and so, Perhaps uh, this was not a particle after all. Perhaps this was some kind of a negatively charged ray uh, that only uh, as it moved, the magnetic field would affect it, but the electrical field did not. So it was a great controversy. Was this a particle or was this a wave, this, this ray? 
the uh, the great expert in in this field at the time was Philip Leonard. Uh, he did very extensive work on these cathode rays. Developed a number of different kinds of cathode tubes for different purposes. Um, he, for example, uh, studied very carefully the the of uh, the uh, uh, the ability of uh, these rays to get through certain materials. How kind of how much of a penetrating power did they have? Here's a cute uh, experiment where they put up as the anode uh, a multi cross, so it would be the rays would be directed towards the cross. But if the cross was made of a thick enough material, you could see that the rays wouldn't get through, and it would actually make a shadow where the cross was. Uh, that light was itself very, very interesting. That it was found that as you reduce the pressure lower and lower apparently strengthening the power of the rays, presumably, then the glass behind the anode, which the rays then would go and hit, would fluoresce to beautiful colors. Depending upon the kind of glass, here's a green fluorescence, other kinds of glass would give a beautiful blue fluorescence. All these phenomena were studied very, very in intensely. Um, but the fact that these rays could not be bent by an electric field the fact that they cast these um, shadows like this um, suggested to Leonard, at least, that this was a wave phenomena. And this was what was his position as the, um, as the research pursued. His particular interest, his particular expertise was the penetrating power of, of these rays. How thick could they, how much thickness of different kinds of materials were necessary to stop these rays. He actually developed a kind of tube called a Leonard window in which behind the anode was a hole in the tube which would be plugged with some kind of different materials, aluminum and gold foil and different kinds of metals uh, of different types and different thicknesses. And then he would see how well these cathode rays could get through that window. And he did extensive um, studies um, uh, on that all trying to understand what the nature um, uh, of these rays were. And again, his research in terms of how these rays could penetrate through the different thicknesses of these different window materials, again, to him, supported the idea that these rays were in fact some kind of a wave phenomenon. He worked extensively. His mentor was uh, Heinrich Hertz, uh, the uh, discoverer <laughs> of uh, electromagnetic waves. He was very, very familiar with that work, of course, uh, being uh, probably the most young, the brightest, most uh, promising young um, physicist at the time uh, to be taken on by Hertz. And uh, so he was very much aware of the possibility that these waves were, in fact, a form of light, a form of electromagnetic waves. And that's what he was trying to prove. And so enter 50-year-old uh, 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 Wilhelm Rinken. Uh, not exactly the age, the prime age for doing uh, uh, great discoveries and invention. But he also, as so many other physicists, uh, he had a position in Würzburg, not exactly the center of all research in Germany. But uh, he was a professor there. And uh, he wanted to study these very interesting um, um, cathode rays. And he was particularly interested in the question that Leonard was, was raising, the penetrating power of these rays. So he got himself some, some of these cathode rays uh, tubes designed by Leonard with these Leonard windows. Um, and he was interested in studying just exactly how penetrating these cathode rays would be. Now, if you wanted to study, you know, the rays and how they got out of the of the glass and, and, and what kind of effect they would have. The first thing he wanted to do was to block the fluorescent light coming from the back of the glass. That would, you know, uh, clearly be noise in his experiment. Uh, he only wanted the cathode rays to come out and to affect whatever apparatus he was going to catch them with. So he covered the, uh, the, the Leonard window uh, uh, cathode ray tube with dark paper so that any fluorescence would not interfere with the cathode rays coming out. And the story goes, as it turns out, the first paper that he used, very, very heavy paper that he used, was so thick that he knew from previous experiments that this would also block the cathode rays coming through his Leonard window. 
So he set up the apparatus for you engineers uh, and the audience will see the high, uh, high voltage, uh, voltage coil here, uh, creating the high voltage that's needed uh, for, the, for the tube, the induction coil. Um, and um, he had ready in the room a fluorescent screen because at some point he wanted these cathode rays to go out and, and they would be recorded on a fluorescent screen and he would see just how far they were going and how much they would penetrate. And <clears throat> the fluorescent screen would indicate to him the existence of the cathode rays. Well, the story goes, I think you already know the end of the story. He turns on the juice with this tube completely covered in black paper in which he knew the cathode rays could not get through the black paper. And he just happened to have this fluorescent screen on a stand getting ready for his next experiment. And he turns on the cathode ray tube and the fluorescent screen glows. He knows it's not the fluorescent light because he's got the, the black paper. He knows it's not the cathode rays because he's got the thick black paper. This was quite amazing. Uh, turns out uh, the story goes that the, um, the screen was nine feet away, three meters away. There's even some reports that he turned the screen around so that it wasn't painted pa facing, the tube was not facing the painted side where the patent, painted fluorescent material was. He turned the tube around, <laughs> sorry, he turned the screen around uh, and um, the, uh, the screen glowed anyway. These rays, whatever they were, this new ray went right through the black paper, right through the linen window, right through the back of the, um, of the fluorescent screen to light up the, uh, the surface on the other side. So that is the story, a very interesting story of the accidental discovery uh, of x-rays uh, by, by, by William Rankin. And uh, he spent uh, some months very quietly by himself in the lab, uh, exploring these, lab these rays, trying to find out its properties. Um, he tried to, for example, see if they would obey, for example, the law of reflection uh, as all rays and waves and even billiard balls on smooth surfaces would do. He tried as best he could to try to come to the determination of just exactly what these rays were without very much success very difficult to work with x-rays, uh, particularly in just in their invention. But uh, we do have this, this very famous picture of his wife's uh, hand. Uh, she was a good sport, obviously. <laughs> he did find out, once he found out about the penetrating power of these rays, he had her put his, her hand on, on, the, on a photographic plate and shone the x-rays down through her hand, developed a plate, and uh, this is what he got one of the most famous photographs probably in the history of science. She is uh, said to have said when she saw the, 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 uh, the plate, once it was uh, developed, that uh, I've seen my own death. You can imagine, no one has ever seen anything like a skeleton in, <laughs> unless you see it on a, a, a dead person. The picture on the right is interesting. This is how uh, x-rays were first created. This became a sensation. You can imagine a picture like this, pictures like this became a sensation immediately all around the world. And within less than six months, any major hospital that was worth its salt to had any kind of money at all, got themselves, acquired for themselves a x-ray machine so they could take these kinds of pictures. And it just revolutionized much of, of medicine almost overnight in terms of setting broken bones, instead of uh, looking at bullet wounds, shrapnel and metal bullets left in, in, in um, you know, in soldiers being wounded and um, uh, x-rays for, for, for teeth. It, this was clearly one of the great, great scientific sensations, public sensations really ever in the history of science. And this was the original kind of design for a, an x-ray machine. It was found uh, uh, that if you fired these cathode rays uh, in an evacuated tube against a hard metal, it uh, seems like that tungsten seemed to be uh, a, good, uh, a good metal for, for the anode. So to bang these, these uh, cathode rays, whatever they were, uh, against a hard metal like 
like tungsten, it would give off these x-rays. <clears throat> and um, given the shape uh, of the anode, you could actually almost, almost kind of focus a little bit in one direction at least, the direction of these of these rays would so you could take you could take pictures like this. Before we leave um, Rentgen and, and move on, he did make one other very interesting discovery. He took a cathode ray tube with the pressure you know low, but with the voltage also low, the voltage being so low that there were no cathode rays. You would have to pick up the voltage to be a stronger one before you would get a flow of current. So he had a cathode ray with, with a low pressure, of course, but also a low voltage. So it was sitting there inert. He then shined the x-rays into the tube and the current turned on. Whatever these x-rays were doing, they were creating the ability, not for any additional voltage apparently, the voltage wasn't changing. It was doing something to the air, perhaps, to, to allow the current to begin to flow. Okay? This would, 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 would be looked on more carefully in the future to try to understand what was going on. Very interesting use of the cathode ray tube um, to detect uh, if you could start a, a current under certain circumstances. We'll see this again. OK. One more thing I like to say about, about Rankin, he was a very modest man uh, and uh, he um, delivered a talk to his local university. The doctors invited him <laughs> to, give it, to give a talk, which he did. And he was, I think he was even in, uh, uh, inducted into the medical uh, um, academy uh, for his work. He never published another paper on it uh, after his initial research. He never, went and gave another public presentation. Um, he became a very, very famous man. And in Germany, uh, I'm told, uh, x-rays are still called Röntgen rays. They were called Röntgen rays for a long time, as, uh, as well as x-rays for a long time throughout the world. He was a very famous man. He was the first winner of the Nobel Prize. Um, um, but a very modest man and never capitalized on this and just continued to work in uh, the university uh, uh, until his retirement. Uh, interesting story. We come to the second discovery. Let me go through this and then I'll stop for some questions. Uh, the discovery of the electron. This is not a story of accidental discovery, quite the opposite. <clears throat> One of the things that J.J. Thompson was able to do in order to affect his discovery was he solved the problem of the bending of the cathode rays by the electric field. What he realized was that the, that, that, that the gas pressure was still too high. He had to find a way to make a different kind of tube, which is explained in the video I asked you to watch, to uh, create a, a tube that would have less of an ioniz uh, ionization effect uh, on the air, and also to just to bring the pressure down even lower. When he was able to, to do that, then the electric field was able to bend uh, the cathode rays. So you could bend them uh, in, in one way by a magnetic field, by another way by an electric field. And you see his wonderful setup here. And yes, this is exactly our old fashioned television tube. Young people would not recognize this, of course. This went out probably, what, in the 80s or so when we began to get the plasma screens. But this is the tube, certainly, that we grew up with in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, where you could control the beam uh, going back and forth, painting the screen. And so this is truly the forerunner of the original television tube. Uh, designed by, by Thompson. Just as the cathode ray tube is the, uh, the forerunner of basically all of your vacuum tubes and your neon lights. Um, so upon solving this problem, he then could manipulate uh, by manipulating the strengths of the magnetic and, and, and electric field, he could manipulate the uh, divergence of this, uh, of this stream of cathode rays. <clears throat> And from that, he was able to ascertain what they were. <clears throat> his picture of, of his setup, you can see the, the plates here for the electric field, the magnetic field is on either side. Uh, 
Uh, we can't see that in this picture. And uh, he had two dimensions to his tube that were important to him. One was the actual length that the distance that the cathode rays would move through once the bending started. The bending would begin here, where there were the two fields, electromagnetic. And he had his fluorescent screen here. And so one was the length in which the uh, cathode rays would move while they were being uh, uh, diverted from their original straight line uh, direction coming from the uh, cathode. And the second dimension he could measure was that actual displacement. When the, when the, when the rays actually did finally hit the, f the fluorescent screen at the, at the back of the tube, he could see the spot uh, where it hit and see the displacement from the straight line when, the, uh, when there was no electric field or magnetic field disturbing at all. Those were his two dimensions that, that he could measure uh, from, from the, de the deflection of his cathode rays. A wonderful derivation that's done in high school physics that I will not bore you with, the algebra, but using three fundamental laws of uh, classical physics, Newton's second law, uh, F is equal to ma, the law on uh, the force of an electric field on a charge, force is equal to the strength of the electric field times uh, the, the amount of charge, and the force that a charge, a moving charge, is, is exerted on by a magnetic field, B. You need the charge to be moving with a certain velocity, and of course, the its amount of charge to, the, to, uh, to have the magnetic field create a force. So these are three classical uh, uh, force laws, which are covered in high school physics. And what he was able to do is derive this equation. He was able to derive an equation that would, that would calculate the, what the displacement would be. And if you look at the, the variables, the elements of the equation, it makes sense. The amount of displacement was proportional to the amount of charge that these, these particles, uh, he assumed, were. So the greater the charge, the greater the force, the greater the displacement. Certainly was uh, proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. It was also proportional to how much length you gave uh, these uh, particles to move through so that the displacement could be more and more pronounced. So that made sense that it was in the numerator. It made sense that it was inverse proportional to the mass of these particles. Heavier the particles there are, the more difficult it is to, to knock them off their original course. And finally, because of the laws of physics, which we don't go into, it was also inversely proportional to the uh, electric field. So a very reasonable equation that he was able to derive theoretically. And uh, of course, he had two unknowns uh, in his equation. He could measure D, he could measure the magnetic field he was using, he could measure R, and he could measure E, the electrical field he was using. What he didn't know was the charge on these cathode rays, nor did he know the mass, assuming that it was a particle. He was convinced it was a particle. So he goes ahead and his, his famous result is he calculates the charge to mass ratio that he could solve for, because everything on the other side are all measured numbers. And he gets a number. A big number, it sounds like 180 million uh, coulombs per gram. Sounds like a lot, but you realize that's coulombs per gram. <laughs> uh, one of these little charges, uh, cathode rays, elements is not one gram, not even close. So, um, although this is a to the correct order of magnitude, the correct number, don't be taken off by how big it is. It's because it's the coulombs per gram, not per not per charge uh, of these of these small particles. <coughs> He was also found that these, he could obviously measure the speed. He needed that uh, to measure his force. Um, and he found that the speed fast was only one third the speed of light. That told him it was not a wave. It was not an electromagnetic wave. In fact, was a particle. And also very, very interestingly, he found that this result, the charge to mass ratio was independent of whatever metal he was using as a cathode. This was quite something because it was the cathode that was creating the cathode rays. 
something of the atoms of the cathode, whatever the cathode was being made out of, was releasing this form of electricity in the form of these cathode rays. And no matter what metal he used, no matter what atomic weight of metal he used, the charge to mass ratio of the cathode rays was always the same. It was independent of the element that he was using. Okay, to complete the story, it was also found uh, uh, in the 1870s, I believe by Crookes originally, that there were rays also going in the other direction, that for certain uh, um, gases that we used to, in, in, the, in the tube, uh, not only was air used, but different gases were used, hydrogen, helium, neon was used, uh, the first neon tube, decorative tube was used. It was found uh, that when, uh, it was found by, uh, by Wien uh, in 1898, <clears throat> very soon after um, uh, Thompson's work, that if you used hydrogen gas, the rays coming in the other direction, the rays now coming from, from the anode through to the cathode, which would therefore be positive rays. If you use hydrogen gas, then he, he then Wein, uh, Wein set up the same apparatus and he calculated the mass to charge ratio for the gas, for the hydrogen gas, which was now somehow or other uh, had a positive charge because it was being attracted towards the towards the uh, towards the uh, cathode okay <clears throat> so uh so here we have our cathode rays going towards the anode a good old-fashioned cathode rays but here's what he called canal rays because his the cathode he used he may put holes in it so that he could get them through so he could register uh, these these uh, these larger heavier uh, positive charges so they were called canal rays historically he was able to measure the, the charge to mass ratio of these new canal rays, these positively charged rays coming from the hydrogen gas. And he found that the charge to mass ratio was 1800 times smaller than that big number that Thompson found for the charge to mass ratio for uh, his cathode rays, which by then uh, were recognized, you know, and <clears throat> eventually given the name electrons. So the great conclusion that Thompson was able to make once he saw this, once he saw the results um, of, of, of Wien's experiment, here we have our setup, okay, and let's call M sub H the mass of these hydrogen atoms that are, that are being apparently ionized in some way, being charged so they'll move uh, towards the cathode, the negative cathode. Here's the mass of his electrons, his original cathode rays, we'll call that M sub E. And Thompson now makes two assumptions. He's assuming that the hydrogen gas becomes charged hydrogen items. Clearly they're charged because they're attracted to the negative cathode. So they're positively charged. He's assuming that re they remain hydrogen atoms, but they have a charge to them. <clears throat> And since he knows hydrogen is the lightest element that there is, whatever the charge, whatever the positive charge is on these individual hydrogen atoms would be exactly the same charge that would be on his cathode rays. So the cathode rays individually, those particles, let's call them cathode particles, let's call them electrons, were, were, were holding the smallest electrical charge on the negative side the smallest atom would, would be holding the smallest positive charge possible. An assumption, okay? something that would have to be proved. But with those two assumptions, and wine showing that the charge, the charge to mass ratio of the electron is 1800 times greater than the charge to mass uh, of these uh, hydrogen atoms, if you assume that the two charges are the same, let's cancel those out of the equation and solve for the mass of the electron. Simple algebra, cross multiply, 
And the mass of the electron is one eighteen hundredth of the mass of these hydrogen atoms. But wait, it's been known for a long, long time that the smallest atoms known in the universe <laughs> in 1898 was hydrogen. There is nothing smaller, there is nothing lighter than hydrogen. We now have a particle which is 1800 times lighter than the lightest thing ever known. Thomson sums it up best. We have in the cathode rays matter in a new state, a state in which the subdivision of matter is carried very much further than in the ordinary gaseous state, a state in which all matter is of one and the same kind, the state he's talking about. This matter being a substance from which all the chemical elements must be built up because this, these rays, these cathode rays, these particles are the same no matter what metal he used uh, as a cathode. He has, in effect, the first subatomic particle, some piece of the atom. And he goes further in his speculation. He says, th this piece, these electrons, as they uh, became to be called soon after, are in fact the constituents of all, of all atoms. Um, he even went further, uh, got, got, got kind of carried away, <laughs> and said that atoms were in fact made up of these electrons. They were different combinations uh, of electrons. That was, that was his first uh, speculation for a while. Last thing I want to say uh, is uh, about his discovery was uh, since he had the mass to charge ratio, it would be nice to know the mass or the charge. All he had was a ratio between the two. This was first done by his student and, and him, uh, uh, C.T.R. Wilson, uh, just a year later in 1899. <clears throat> by that time, Wilson had developed his earliest version of the famous cloud chamber, which did tremendous work throughout uh, all of the early 1900s in the development of the atom. Uh, Wilson finally winning the Nobel Prize for, the, for his work uh, uh, and the, device, the research that could be done with the cloud chamber by so many. He won the Nobel Prize in 1927 for it. But as a student of Thomson uh, in the early days with his earliest uh, iteration of the cloud chamber, they actually, you know, sent these um, uh, electrons, the cathode rays, um, through his cloud chamber and could measure through the trajectory. If you can see these ghostly lines by measuring the curvature of these trajectories, you can uh, you know, see them uh, actually through the chamber. And they did a very simple thing. They simply counted how the electrons went through, probably something like a window, uh, into the cloud chamber and then would, would register uh, onto a, an electroscope, which would measure the building up of the charge. And you do simply just count how many electrons went through the chamber, how the charge built up, you do a division and you get a first estimate of what exactly the charge would be per, uh, per electron. And the number that they got was uh, very much in the correct order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, a tiny, tiny number, the electric charge of an electron. The modern value you can see is of that same um, same order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 19th um, coulombs. Okay, so those are the first uh, two discoveries I want to go through. Greg, do we have any questions? Um, Peter, we have no questions. Great. Okay, let's move on now to our final story. Um, actually, we're we're doing well on time. We may be able to even get to our our next presentation. Let's see. Here we have. Uh, just as famous uh, uh, a discovery story, another wonderful accidental discovery. So we all love these accidental discovery stories, right? There, there are a number of them uh, in science. <clears throat> we go back to the the the, the fluorescence of. Uh, oh, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to say one other thing about about um, Renkin and um, and and Leonard. Leonard was furious when. Renkin was given the Nobel Prize, the very first Nobel Prize for his discovery of x-rays. Leonard said, 
I did that experiment <laughs> that Rankin did dozens of times for years. He even used my own apparatus of the leaded window. What, because he had a fluorescent screen in the room? This is why he got, this is the kind of guy uh, Leonard was. We'll say more about Leonard as time goes on uh, with his relationship to Einstein. <clears throat> but he was, he made such a stink uh, trying to belittle the work of Rankin, just really a uh, terrible kind of thing. Yes, he could have easily discovered x-rays and become very, very famous for that, but he didn't. Same story with uh, J.J. Thompson. Uh, he was not able to, uh, you know, get the right vacuum, get the right glass, although he was the expert on cathode rays, to finally be able to manipulate the way Thompson did so he could take those measurements. But certainly Leonard was completely capable, once that tube was developed, he was completely capable of doing all those measurements and coming to that conclusion. But he thought cathode rays were a wave. That way he was convinced of that and was behind the curve on the research and Thompson uh, went ahead and uh, did this. And uh, yes, Leonard could have definitely been the discoverer of the electron as well. And he would be certainly one of the most famous scientists uh, uh, of that period, someone who probably you never heard of. So uh, Leonard uh, has, has an interesting story of just, of just missing things. Um, uh, I must tell you, we're going to be talking a lot about in our next presentation about Rutherford. At the time that these discoveries were made, was a, was a young postdoc uh, working for J.J. J. Thompson. And uh, when Thompson heard about Röntgen's discovery, uh, he right away saw the, uh, the, the interest here of these cathode rays. There was more to these cathode rays than, than, than meets the eye now that they create in some way x-rays. So he decided to turn his attention, as many people did, to cathode rays, looking at them much more uh, closely, uh, if nothing else, because of this new property that they had. And we have an interesting letter that uh, Rutherford writes to his fiance back in, back in um, New Zealand, uh, which I want to read to you. He says, the professor, J.J. Thompson, who he's, who he's a postdoc for, has been very busy lately over the new method of photography discovered by Professor Röntgen. The professor, J.J. Thompson, of course, is trying to find out the real cause and the nature of these waves. And the great object is to find the theory of matter before anyone else, for every professor in Europe is now on the warpath. <laughs> this is him writing back to his, uh, his fiance uh, that everyone, all the professors in Europe are on the warpath to try to come to an understanding of just what these cathode rays are and what's going on in the creation, and never mind the fluorescence, of these mysterious new x-rays. Um, and so I wanted to just mention that to you. Okay, well, let's get back to the fluorescence. We have here the, the, the world's expert on fluorescence, uh, French professor Henri Baccarat. He was, in a, he's, he was the world's expert on fluorescence as his father was before him, apparently as his grandfather was before him. He held the same position as his grandfather and his father at the university he was at, and he was the world expert on fluorescence. When he heard that the fluorescence of the cathode ray tube was now creating x-rays, that was his interpretation, that was the fluorescence, which he was the world expert on, was it creating the x-rays. And so he set about to study that. And so the story goes um, that um, he was using his fluorescent material, which were basically uranium salts, Uranium, I should say, was discovered way, way back. Uranium was uh, an old uh, uh, element, uh, discovered back in 1789 uh, by a German chemist, and it was been used for years in the in the dye industry to make yellow dye. We know the phrase "yellow cake" from our, you know, centrifuge and creation of nuclear materials <clears throat> stories. Um, it was discovered, uh, and it was actually discovered in this material uh, that you would mine, it's kind of gook, called pitch blend, uh, 
uh, in which you could uh, synthesize out at least the uranium oxides, and, and then from that you could create the yellow dye. Um, the uranium uh, was finally uh, actually isolated uh, as an element um, um, in, in that time, and it was named after uh, Uranus, the newly discovered planet by Herschel. So that's how it's got its name, by its name named after the new planet. But uh, Baccarat was, was using uranium salts, which would fluoresce, very well-known property. It would shine light, uh, particularly sunlight was a very good uh, light to use. You would shine light on these fluorescent salt, these salts, and they would glow. And he would study this in great detail, how long they glowed, how much they, the light diminished over time, how, how bright the light was, how it could penetrate different materials. And of course, what was the source? What was the sunlight doing to these salts that would make them glow, make them fluorescent? <clears throat> he was an expert on this. So he had the notion that if there was fluorescence, maybe there was x-rays, just, like just like with the cathode ray tube. He was gonna discover an, a, a, a pure source of x-rays just coming from his beloved fluorescence. So he set up a very nice experiment, one that you could explain to a middle, middle schooler, very much the, 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 um, the, the classic example of a scientific method. You have a hypothesis and you set up an experiment. And this is exactly what he did. So he had himself a sample of, uh, of uranium salts, fluorescent salts, and he would expose them to the sun, get them to fluoresce, then he would wrap them in black paper, put them on top of an undeveloped uh, photographic plate, uh, and set the fluorescent salts on the black paper on the, on the plate, and let it sit uh, in a, you know, a darkened room, obviously. Uh, and let, the, uh, let the, the salts just do their magic. Uh, they were covered in black paper, so the fluorescent light couldn't get out. Uh, so the only thing that could get out, as was well known, was uh, if they were there, were x-rays. He was wanted to then uh, uh, develop the plate and see some kind of development, see some kind of energy uh, blacken blackness on the plate that would show that there was some kind of rays. Obviously, what he was looking for was x-rays, rays that he knew could get through the black plate. And this was his design, very nice, very simple. And it would prove to the world that pure fluorescence created x-rays. And it wasn't the cathode rays <laughs> at all. In fact, it was the fluorescence, his beloved fluorescence that was creating the x-rays. So the story goes, that uh, he was in the middle of these series of experiments and he had his samples he had his kits all made up with his samples and his black paper and his under and his, his undeveloped photographic plates and uh one day he was going to start a new round of experiments and it was raining that day in paris so no sun so he took his wrapped up the, the salts were, were wrapped up in the black paper and the, the, the plate, undeveloped plate. He put the whole little kit into a drawer and there it sat. Well, you know what? It rained the next day too. No sun. There it sat in the darkened drawer. <clears throat> His uranium salts, totally in the dark, sitting on an undeveloped plate. And after the third day, the sun comes out and he takes the plate they set up out of the drawer. And for some reason, he says, you know, <laughs> just for the hell of it, let me develop the plate. And he does. And this is what he gets. Again, one of the most famous pictures in the history of science. This is his plate of the uranium salts, not fluorescing. And even if they were, <laughs> they were totally covered in black paper. This is a development of his plate. It wasn't x-rays. <laughs> you knew it wasn't that. It was yet another ray. Um, it did not have the characteristics of x-rays. He called them uranic rays because they were made from these uranium salts. And here we have another, as I, I, I told you, 
uh, this was a time of being ray happy. <laughs> Something was discovered, not knowing whether it was a wave, it was a particle, so they called it a, a, a ray. Dr. Rao found that the that the these rays were coming from the salt. You could do all kinds of things with the salt. It wouldn't affect um, the production of these rays. And of course, it had nothing to do with fluorescence, as he quickly saw. <laughs> um, you could take these salts and crush them up and heat them and freeze them and put them into other compounds. It didn't matter. Uh, the, the, uh, the effect would still create on the plates uh, was virtually the same. Enter his uh, graduate student, Marie Curie. Um, she had by, by that time had married uh, Pierre Curie, uh, was looking for a doctoral subject to take up uh, at the Sorbonne for her doctorate. And uh, these new rays were very, very interesting to her. X-rays were still all the rage and cathode rays and electrons, but she wanted to study these new uranic rays. And so she approached Baccarel to become his, his graduate student to do research in this area for, for her, her doctorate. And uh, her husband quickly saw the great uh, uh, interest and great scientific uh, um, possibility of this new kind of ray and actually began to join her um, uh, in, in, in the research. Uh, wonderful video, although he talks too fast, <laughs> uh, of her life, very, very fascinating life. I was particularly interested that he was able to go into enough detail about her early life before she even got to Paris, being brought to Paris by her older sister, who was also at the Sorbonne studying. Uh, they lived together, dirt poor, <laughs> uh, trying to, you know, get through very, very interesting life uh, that she had. A brilliant woman, obviously, first in the class and everything, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, she starts this research. And uh, one of the things that they do is they systematically go through all of the other elements to see if they create these uranic rays. One of the first things they discover is that thorium, uh, very close to uranium in the periodic table, also gives out these rays, will also darken uh, a plate um, just, by, just by its own presence. Um, and uh, thorium, again, is, an, even, is a, a, an old element around a long time, actually discovered by our friend Vesalius. Uh, he named it after the, uh, being, being a Swedish uh, physicist, named it after the god Thor. That's where thorium comes from. Uh, and they just went through systematically all of the elements uh, that they could to see which ones gave off these kinds of rays. And uh, thorium um, was discovered to be one. <clears throat> I mean, uh, Becquerel, I think, I think it was Becquerel. Let me see, Becquerel. Yeah, he makes a very interesting um, discovery. You remember from middle school, uh, an electroscope, you can charge a rod, you know, plastic rod against nylon and fur. And you remember that stuff, you, the rod will be charged, uh, electrically charged. And you can bring the charge towards this thing called an electroscope. It's simply a long piece of metal. Uh, isol insulated um, from, from, from the glass tube that it, that it sits in, and it ends with two very, very thin pieces of, uh, of metal. Aluminum for cheap ones, very, very thin gold for expensive ones. <clears throat> and if you bring the charged uh, rod towards the top of the electroscope, then since we know like charges attract, the, the charges in the metal will move up, uh, the positive charges uh, Will, will move up to be attracted towards the, the negative charge of the rod. And since we now have an imbalance where the positive charge is up on the top, and there'll be an imbalance of a negative charge down the bottom where these very, very thin, close together uh, plates are. Uh, and uh, since like charges repel, the, the, the foil, very thin foil will separate. And so you can see there's a manifestation of the charge on the foil and therefore on the rod. So an electroscope. You can also charge the electroscope completely by having the rod touch the top metal. Then these excess charges will rush into the metal and the whole uh, electroscope will become 
in this case, negatively charged. Or if you did it with this way, the whole retroscope, if you touch it, will become positively charged. So this is something you remember from 18 zillion years ago in middle school science. Okay. Bacquerel did a very interesting thing, very similar to what Renkin did. He had himself, he charged an electroscope, and then he brought close his uranic rays. And the foil collapsed. The charge went away. So in the Renkin's case, apparently the electricity was created by his x-rays, where all of a sudden the current began to flow, even through the low voltage. Here, what the uranic rays were doing were they were dissipating the charge uh, of the electroscope. They became neutral. And it happened virtually immediately, as soon as you brought the rays towards the, uh, towards the electroscope. So what, what is the relationship between these rays and electrical charge? The x-ray on one side and the uranic rays on the other. These things will have to be explained. Eventually, we will get the, the explanation here that the radiation, what's going on is it is ionizing the air in the electroscope. Uh, they're creating electrical charges. Um, the energy of these rays are so powerful that they're creating a, an ionization of the air in the, uh, in the electroscope, creating positive and negative charges. And those positive charges will be attracted to the electrical, the negatively charged uh, electroscope and immediately neutralize it um, to bring down the leaves. That was not known at the time. Okay, given that, something that the Curious then tried, the same thing that Rankin tried, exactly the same setup, a low, a low voltage uh, Crookes tube, uh, cathode ray tube, Good, good, low pressure, but a very low uh, um, um, voltage. Sorry, I, I highlighted low pressure. I meant to highlight low voltage as in the other, in the other um, um, screen. Uh, low voltage so that you would not get a current. Voltage wasn't high enough to get a current. You bring the uh, radioactive material next to the tube and the current begins to flow. Okay, with this radioactive material, a word coined by, by Marie, by Marie Curie. Okay, to move quickly through, 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 through their wonderful discoveries, uh, using, all know a famous story, using this gook of pitch blend, uh, which had been around forever, which was mined to get the uranium out of, um, they found that there was radioactivity clearly in the pitch blend that did not surprise them since the uranium salts were creating the uranium craze. Uh, they measured the amount of radioactivity uh, in the pitch blend and they found it to be even higher than the pure uranium salts. There was something else going on in there. And the famous stories go that they discovered two new elements. First one, polonium which she named after Poland, her home country. And the second one, which created the sensation, was radium. That was the, that was the material, new element, that was even had a stronger radioactivity um, than, um, <clears throat> than even the original uranium, this radium. Yes, they did have a, a, a nice ability to begin to measure the strength of radioactivity, something also that they developed and the unit of strength eventually began to, was, was finally named uh, the Curie. Question was, where does this energy come from, from these rays given off by these now radioactive materials, as they were called? <clears throat> the Curie has found, for example, that uh, these materials would give off energy pound for pound greater than any conventional heat source that they knew that was known, like, for example, burning coal or wood. Later on, uh, Pierre Curie showed that radium in particular was such a powerful energy source that pound for pound, it gave off more energy than any chemical reaction known. Like for example, dynamite. We're talking about some energy source way beyond any chemical reaction um, that is known. <clears throat> radium then, upon discoveries like this became a great sensation, very much like x-rays. Uh, 
Not so much until radium was discovered. Becquerel's discovery didn't cause a great stir, but when radium was discovered, this, this, the, the, the world took notice. Uh, it, was, it was such a powerful source that if you painted it on dials, it would glow in the dark, uh, and it had its first great use in that. Um, uh, if you could find today a watch made that was with painted the dials, were painted in radium. I'm told they're of great, great value. You, they don't make them anymore. They're outlawed because of the danger of the radium. And there are other easier materials to uh, and to develop uh, that kind of glow. But they originally were done for that. It just took over the world. It became a beauty product. This energy coming out all the time was something that was good for you. And it was used in toothpaste and creams and uh, all kinds of stuff. People had no idea how dangerous um, in the early days um, th th this, this stuff was. I mentioned that the discovery of radioactivity uh, actually was a great boon to, to you know, um, discovering new elements, polonium and radium too. Here's another one, uh, one of their associates who began to work with the Curies, uh, uh, Andre uh, Dubonier, here he is right here, and, photograph later on uh, in the 1920s when they set up their institute, uh, he discovered using the leftovers of the pitch blend, the sludge, uh, you know, the famous story about what the curious had to do, they had to go through tons of this pitch blend, distilling it down through different kinds of chemical reactions, half of which they invented in isolating and isolating and isolating the uh, minute amounts of the um, of the radioactive element that was still there and then distilling it down and getting really more junk and, and keeping the radioactive. Um, <clears throat> finally, I think they got one gram of radium out of tons of the pitch plant that they started with. Well, Dubonnet, he took the, the, the leftovers, uh, which still, of course, very ra radioactive, and he found a new element in the pitch plant as well um, called, uh, called actium, element number 89. So the first Nobel Prize comes awarded to the three of them, Baccarel and the, and the Curious were awarded in recognition of the extraordinary services they've rendered by their joint researches on the radiation phenomenon discovered by Professor Henri Baccarel, okay? giving, the, uh, giving the nod to the senior scientist. The Curious, of course, were much too busy in their research at the time to go to Sweden to accept their, their prize. They were a very intense couple, as you can imagine. <laughs> Very intense. So they, 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 they didn't get there for a couple of years. They did finally get there after a year or so, and they did give their, um, their Nobel speech. Like I say, it did become an international, with the discovery of radium, it became famous. They became uh, internationally famous, particularly as a married couple. Very, very, you know, not very common in, in, uh, in those days. Um, there were some famous couples, one comes to mind in astronomy, but typical kind of story. Just the wife didn't have her own degrees or anything like that. Brilliant in, in her own right, but not formally trained, trained by her husband, very much like Lavoisier's wife of a hundred years before. Here's a different story. Here we have uh, <clears throat> a woman who's not just a wife, but actually a trained physicist in, in, in her own right. Clearly brilliant, so breaking the mold breaking the mold in so many ways. Uh, so she becomes the most famous woman scientist in the world. She still is today the most famous woman scientist of the world. There's a, there was a survey recently done of uh, asking who was the most uh, famous woman scientist. And most people couldn't name very many people. You give people a list of names and Curie always uh, wins uh, a contest like that. Um, the, 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 the next one uh, after that, who people recognize um, on the list is uh, the woman from uh, um, the D DNA fame of, of the double helix. Who do I mean? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, she, she usually Franklin. number two. Just drawing, just an elder, a senior moment, guys. I apologize. 
uh, but Jury is still still uh, in, in the public, uh, the most famous woman scientist there ever was. She finally does get her PhD uh, uh, with all these discoveries. Uh, Pierre's uh, assigned um, professor of the Sorbonne. And in 1906, tragedy strikes where he is killed. Um, freak accident, a cart gets loose on, on a hill. He's at the bottom of the hill, gets knocked by this cart and is his uh, uh, skull is crushed, dies immediately. Interesting story. Um, um, she's asked to take over his lectures. This is a great sensation in itself. For her first lecture, the lecture hall is crowded with the press and all kinds of onlookers, anybody who can get in. What's going to happen? This is the first woman ever to teach a class at the Sorbonne. Uh, is she gonna crumble under the pressure? Uh, is she gonna, what is she, how is she gonna behave in front of this? Curie gets up, uh, you know, in front of the class, you know, the typical chemistry, there's a photograph somewhere of her, typical teacher's bench, blackboard behind her. She calmly just begins <laughs> the lecture exactly where her husband left off exactly at that point and just proceeds as if nothing happened. She's a tough lady. She wins a second Nobel Prize uh, in 1911. She is the only person <clears throat> to win a Nobel Prize in two different uh, disciplines. There are other subsequent people who have won two Nobel Prizes uh, in physics, Bardeen, uh, of the transistor fame um, is one, there may be a second. But no one up to this date has won a Nobel Prize in, in each. And of course, she is uh, the first woman uh, to win a Nobel Prize. <clears throat> Haven't been that many Nobel Prizes in the physical science by women. I think there have been four in physics and seven um, in, uh, in, in chemistry. And uh, very interesting. Um, the two Nobel Prizes, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year, 2020, was by two women. Uh, and uh, very interesting, uh, one of them, Jennifer uh, Dudna, is the subject of a wonderful book by, Isaac, uh, uh, by Walter Isaacson called The Codebreaker, given her life and, and, and her work leading up to the Nobel Prize, uh, The Codebreaker. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading it. So yes, there have been four physics prizes given to women. Also, physics prize uh, was also given this year, shared prize to a woman. And uh, two women won the chemistry prize this year. So maybe the Nobel Committee is finally trying to make up for lost ground, recognizing these people. Just to quickly finish up uh, the rest of Curie's uh, life, very interesting life. Uh, it's a picture with her oldest daughter, Irene, become a great physicist in her own right eventually. In World War I, she took to the road of, of uh, um, doing x-ray work out in the field, out in the battlefield and in the field hospitals uh, for uh, shrapnel wounds um, and other kinds of wounds by the, by the, by the soldiers. It was a tremendous help and saving, not doing so many amputees, not just automatically cutting people's arms and legs off, as they had to do, for example, so famously in the Civil War. You could take an x-ray of where the shrapnel was located. A surgeon could go in there and take out the shrapnel, as opposed to cutting off someone's arm. A tremendous uh, advance. Uh, she went ahead and uh, began to set up mobile units by truck, field hospital units uh, having these x-ray machines. Um, did tremendous work in, in this area. She continued just to be very world famous, trips to America, meeting presidents, getting donations for her, uh, her um, first, first of all, for her research institute in Paris, uh, uh, the Radium Institute uh, funded by the government. And eventually she moved back with her sister to Poland and, uh, and uh, opened up a oncology um, institute, which still is uh, still exists today. Again, her focus seems to have moved towards the medical uh, usage of uh, of X-rays and and radioactivity. Um, 
and she finally died in 1934. Ironically, the very year that uh, her daughter and her son-in-law uh, made a great discovery in radioactivity, which we'll be covering when we get to, get to her, her, her story. It's a very, very famous picture uh, of the 1927 <clears throat> Salovey Conference. This has been said to be the greatest concentration of uh, physics talent ever before or since. <clears throat> you can go through these names down, guys, here. It'd be very interesting if you ever had the patience of Googling uh, each of these names, uh, getting a Wikipedia of each of these names and seeing how many of these people are Nobel Prize winners. But they're all here at this conference, this cohort up here. This is the uh, quantum mechanics crowd up here. But I want to turn your attention to these folks here. This guy here needs no uh, introduction. This is Paul uh, uh, Langevin. Uh, he was a student of Pierre Curie's and J.J. Thompson, by the way. Uh, married man came involved in an affair with uh, Curie many years after Pierre Curie died. They had an affair, it became public. She was lambasted in the Paris French press. First of all, being Polish, <laughs> never being completely forgiven for that. But lambasted as a homewrecker and uh, you know, terrible woman and uh, really suffered uh, terribly uh, you know, professionally, uh, not professionally in a close professional crowd, but in society in general. Didn't bother her too much, it seems. She was just so so focused on, on her work. But she knew everyone. She was friends with everyone. Rutherford would come and stay with her when he came to Paris. She was very good friends with Einstein. <clears throat> very much respected by everyone <clears throat> in that group. But I, 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 I want to point out, here are the three great, uh, great doms, you know, the great uh, uh, figures uh, 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 of the story here, the oldest people in this picture. And I just call your attention, this is Lorenz. He is the godfather of them all. He's 74 in this picture. This is Max Planck. He is 69. And here is Marie Curie. She is 60. Yeah. This is the toll that the radiation has taken on her. Uh, she, looks, she, she, looks the old, she looks older, in my opinion, than the other two. But she's yet, in fact, only 60. The, the toll that the radiation took on her uh, was devastating. And of course she died of bone uh, leukemia, um, you know, a few years, a few years after this. Okay, so her legacy, you can see the various things we've talked, we've touched upon all of them. The one that I've highlighted, the one that I want us to, to, to stick with is that she established that radioactivity was an atomic property not a chemical property of compounds. She showed this definitively. <clears throat> you could do whatever you want to uranium and thorium and radium. You can do anything you want physically with them. You can combine them with any kind of compounds. You can break them down and you can do anything you want. The radioactivity will stay. What radioactivity is, whatever it is, is a property of the atom itself not anything to do with the combinations of what radium is or uranium is combined in with, with other atoms. She was able to establish that definitively. Finally, she was, uh, although she was never inducted into the, uh, the French Academy, yeah, two Nobel Prize were, two Nobel Prize uh, as uh, discovering two, um, uh, elements, no, she was not inducted ever into the French Academy. That took until 1962. Yeah. We'll tell her story when that happens, the first woman to be inducted to the French Academy. Ironically, maybe um, uh, the way it should be, she was, her, she was a, a student of Madame Curie, one of, one of her major students. We'll tell that story when we come to it. Okay. Greg, while I switch gears, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, any questions that we have outstanding? Uh, yes, Peter, we have some questions from Joe Parisi. Yes. Did Ween, is that how you pronounce it? <coughs> Ween, take the next step or one. That if the electron was one eighteen hundredths of the mass of the hydrogen atom, 
something needed to comprise the balance of the mass and that it needed to have a positive charge, i.e. a proton. Very true, but that was not Soar at the beginning. He got so carried away with his electrons, he actually thought for a year or so that what atoms were were different combinations of, I don't know, electrons in some way. This was actually seriously taken. We'll see in, the, in, in, the, in this presentation here that I'm about to start uh, um, that eventually he moves to his famous plum pudding model where the electrons are now negatively charged, embedded in some mass of <coughs> charge, positive charge where, you know, uh, the, where, where, where the mass is in this diffuse positive charge. So eventually he will get, Joe, to where you are. But actually it took him <laughs> a little while to get there. He actually thought there was just a gazillion of these electrons which would make up the mass of the, of the atoms. And Andrew Sherman has a question. What kind of energy comes out of quartz batteries? That is a great Google question, Andrew. <laughs> I don't know. Who, who, who can Google that first <laughs> to find out? I don't know. Uh, I, what is that? That's if some, that's some kind of fluorescence. If it is some kind of fluorescence, we know that fluorescence is basically a chemical phenomenon. Light is given out by a chemical change, not, not anything nuclear. Um, so if, if, if that is a fluorescent phenomenon, then you're talking at base some kind of a chemical process phenomenon. Anything we else? have a, a statement by Michael Latham. Linus Pauling won a Nobel in chemistry, then won in peace. In peace, yes. I was talking about people winning in the sciences. Okay, I was just kind of focus on that, not, not taking anything away from the Peace Prize and his work in that area. But I, I, I was focusing on, uh, on people winning the, in the sciences. Um, and that's why he didn't come to mind. Last question from Mary Covington. Which biography of Marie Curie do you recommend? Uh, as, as, as a book, um, I, I, don't, I don't have a recommendation uh, for that. Uh, Mary, you definitely should go out and, and Google that. You know, definitely Google biographies of, uh, of Mary Curie and, and get recommendations from places like Goodreads. You may, you may know the site Goodreads. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sure. And I would love to, uh, and please email me. I would love to, I would love to know what, what you find. As a, I would love to put that in to one of my emails to, to, as a recommendation. Because she had such, such a fascinating life. She really did. Um, and what a legacy she, uh, she left. Uh, finally, she was, you know, although she wasn't inducted into the French Academy, she was actually inducted into the Parthenon <laughs> uh, yeah. as the first woman to ever be inducted in, uh, into the Parthenon in, 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 in 1996. Okay, so we're out of time. Uh, I'm showing you the first slide here. Uh, what we're going to go into here is we're going to go into, go into the second stage of um, radioactivity which will give us uh, the work of Rutherford, really the father of nuclear physics. And here's where we'll look at the work of Rutherford. Here's where we'll get the plum pudding model of J.J. Uh, Thompson. Here we will get to the final, to the discovery of, of the nucleus. This is what this presentation will give us next week. Along the way, we will come to the notions of half-life and the actual transmutation of elements. What's going on with radioactivity is these atoms are spontaneously throwing out parts of themselves, changing into yet other atoms. This is one of the really one of the greatest discoveries in all of science. And this was done by Rutherford and his team. So for next week. Okay, if there, uh, let me open up the mic. Uh, are there any questions that we have? Uh, anybody want to throw out questions, comments? Would Andrew like to throw out the answer to his question by Googling it? Does he have an answer? A quick answer, sure. Hello, Andrew. Oh, maybe Andrew's. <laughs> Andrew, I don't put any pressure on you how fast you are in Google. So. Well, I just I just I, Googled. I haven't bothered looking yet. I just okay. Googled and I got a kind of vague answers. Okay, if you're looking for the word fluorescence, then that, that, that'll give you the heart of the, uh, of the process that's being used.
Any other, any other questions or comments? Um, Peter, I have a, a question about in, in this time period when they were getting closer and closer to discovering these particles, previously it, it seems like there was an understanding of waves and, and wavelengths. What, was that already in, in the um, scientific body of knowledge? And if so, how, why did um, the scientists that were doing all of these discoveries not just assume that the wave was just so small, so infinitesimally almost small, that it, it couldn't penetrate, that it, it, it wasn't a wave that was actually penetrating the material? that was in the cathode ray. Right, so two part question. The first part of your question is very much yes, right? The light wave uh, theory was developed around 1800. It only became stronger and stronger and better well known <clears throat> through the 1820s. So the fact that light, visible light was a wave was very, very well known and its properties mm -hmm. very well understood. We have Heinrich Hertz in the 1880s finally developing radio waves the long wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this was very well understood in the 1890s. It's difficult to, uh, to see these rays being produced and what are they? Are they electromagnetic waves or are they particles? This is not an easy question experimentally to, to decipher so well. So looking at their penetrating power was one thing, looking at their other properties, um, uh, you know, for example, like reflection and refraction, things that, that you know, that, that only waves do in terms of, re of refraction. These were the things that were tried uh, to look at, but these experimentally are not easy things to, to decipher. So it took a while to, to figure out just what these, what these guys were. We'll see in this presentation here next week that all, uh, that all of the waves uh, of, of radioactivity are sorted out correctly and we'll look at the experimental evidence that finally did that. Okay, thank you. Okay guys, so uh, let me end uh, the uh, meeting. Uh, the